Kiana, is it okay if we start letting people in? Sorry, let's give it two minutes. Do you want Federica in though? Yes, that's who I'm about to let in right now. Okay, you got that. Hey, Fetty. Hi, Federica. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. Looking forward for today's talk. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, how how does it go there? All good. <clears throat> are you are you coming at A Kim's? Yeah. Nice. Uh, we're going to A Kim's, so um, are you going? Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um yeah. no, that's I have a little bit of a different project, but yeah. Um I'm looking forward to it's going to be the first one in person since quite a while. I know. I know. It seems almost foreign now that. Yeah. I was like, oh, do I have to book a flight? This is so... yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how to do that through my university's travel system when, when I booked the flight. Yeah. I forgot how to do it in general because I could not even go back to Europe. So, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, oh, that that's a that's a new thing. Yeah. All right, so Sadi, we're gonna start letting people in in about thirty seconds, and then um, I'll say go ahead, and then that means everybody's in, and you can start your introduction. Right. Thank you, Kiana. No problem. I guess I need my laser pointer. Oops. Back. Okay, Betty, you can start whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Well, let's maybe let's wait couple more minutes. Um, just to get on. Right. Yeah. Just to get on the on just waiting for the one o'clock. It's one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, I guess we have to start. All right. So well good good afternoon everyone. So I'm very happy to introduce today Dr. Christian Lemon um, uh, for today's seminar. So Christian received his PhD in psychobiology in 2001, and he was a postdoc at the University of Maryland and uh, at the University of Tennessee under the mentorship of, of Dr. Smith. And he was also a research assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. He's now an associate professor at the University of Oklahoma and his lab is interested in sensory processing with a focus on neuronal activity, underlying taste, thermal, and somatosensory sensation, and the behaviors which are associated with them. So happy to hear and uh, his talk today about temperature, uh, the use of temperature to study uh, taste. So Christian, this is, the table is yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, Federica. And yeah, today I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share some of the work my lab is doing, uh, looking at the intersection between temperature and taste processing and how that plays out in the central nervous system and also how it plays out a little bit with, with behavior. So I'm gonna show you some new stuff that we're working on in that regard. <clears throat> so as, as, as taste scientists, you know, you know we, we might try to separate 
the, the sensations of taste and temperature. Um, but in many cases, the nervous system actually seems to want to put these, these sensations together. And this has been shown um, in, in studies that have been performed over, over decades, essentially. Um, and this is an example of, of a sucrose responsive neuron recorded from a rat in the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is the first synapse for taste signaling in the, in the brain. And you can see the cell actually responds not only to sucrose, um, but it also responds to warming of, of the mouth, okay? Um, and it, this is just one example, of course, from this paper, but in this paper, it's actually reported about 75% or so of, of the cells that Ogawa and colleagues recorded were, the taste neurons were, were thermal sensitive. Um, and this, like, this has been shown in, in, in numerous studies, but it's often sometimes overlooked in studies on taste coding and taste processing. It's, it's, it seems like the way that um, we, we sometimes taste neurophysiologists perform their experiments, they actually try to remove this information or remove these signals from their recordings by adapting the mouth, for example, to um, room temperature water if they're testing a room temperature tasting notes, or adapting the mouth to a uh, um, a fluid that's at the same temperature as the taste stimulus. But potentially by, by doing that and removing that activity, we, we may have missed some very important clues that temperature actually can tell us about the way the taste system works. I'm gonna show you some, some data regarding that today. And I don't, not, not only does taste stimulate the gustatory system, it actually also interacts with taste signals um, that are traversing gustatory afferents and neurons. And this is, these are data from, um, these, these are probably actually the very first data to ever show an effect of temperature on the neural signaling of taste. Um, and you can see this, these are very old data. These data were actually never published. They're actually part of a dissertation that was performed in Carl Foffman's lab in the early 1950s. Um, and what Preston Abbott, who was the author of that dissertation, showed was that he could change the temperature of, of a taste solution, in this case, a sodium salt, and it would actually modulate the level of firing in a whole nerve recording from the quarter tympani nerve, which is innervating the rostral two thirds of the tongue. Now, <clears throat> some of the effects of temperature on taste processing are actually due to the fact that um, taste receptor cells express thermosensitive molecular effectors. So the taste transduction cascades involve temperature sensitive ion channels. And, and this, this is a, these are data that are probably familiar to some of you in the audience, whereby trypin-5, which of course is a critical component of the sweet taste transduction cascade, um, was shown to be a heat sensitive ion channel. Um, currents that, are, that trypin-5 passes in both inward and outward currents show, show high temperature sensitivity. And of course, this translates into also temperature sensitivity to sweet taste responses recorded in the mouse quarter tympani nerve. And you can see that as we change the temperature from cool to warm values, we can actually markedly increase the response of the quarter tympani nerve to sucrose. And this effect is, is of course lost in the absence of trypin-5 and trypin-5 knockout mice. Um, and some work from my lab building on this, wanted to, wanted to know, well, is how does temperature affect the, the coding of sweet taste in the CNS? And is, is there an orderly effect of temperature effects on sweet taste processing in, in the brain? And a graduate student of mine, David Wilson, and I developed a method where, whereby we can control the temperature of fluids um, flowing into the mouse of a mouth, mouse of a mouth, the mouse of a mouth, mouse of a mouth of a mouse, while we were sampling the responses of taste neurons in the NTS. And we could rapidly step the temperature from a baseline value um, to, to a, basically any temperature that we wanted to. And you can see, so if we, if we essentially recorded from this particular cell here, these are data from one neuron, if we only tested this temperature, which is right around room temperature, the cell actually shows sort of a very weak response to sucrose. But if we warm the sucrose up, you can see we get this massive increase in, in firing in this cell. There's a, there's a very large um, um, increase in the number of action potentials that the cell produces the sucrose. Also note, we can stop the cell from firing the sucrose if, if we cool the, the stimulus down. Now, if we record from across a large, larger number of neurons, this, this is the effect that we see. And I'm showing you here 
the concentration response functions for mouse MTS neurons um, um, tested with a sucrose concentration series at different temperatures plotted in doubly large coordinates. And what this does is it sort of gives you information on relative change that you might see as you, as you change temperature or concentration. And you can see what happens here is that at high concentrations of sucrose, the effect of temperature is, is much weaker than it is for lower concentrations. There's, in fact, temperature can more wildly change the intensity of, this, of the sucrose response at a, low, at a lower, lower concentration value. Now, this is significant because it's indicating that actually there's an orderly effect of temperature on the, on the coating for taste. But at the same time, this is significant because this is exactly um, what happens in humans in terms of the effect of temperature on the perceptual response to sucrose. You can see that the perceived sweetness of sucrose is, is, is um, less affected by temperature at high molar concentrations and more markedly affected by temperature at low molar concentrations. Okay, And so this, this is suggesting there's a commonality in the way that temperature can affect the processing of, of sweet taste between mice and humans, and that the effect is quite orderly. Okay, and so in today's talk, um, I've already shown you that temperatures can systematically interact with taste. And I'm going to talk to you today about some data where we've tried to understand um, the involvement of the trigeminal system in temperature interactions with taste in the brain and determining if these interactions exist first off and if, and if they are indeed orderly. And in, in the process of this work, we've kind of stumbled into a, a finding where um, we've, we've, we've revealed that there's in a certain part of the mouse CNS, there's, there's what appears to be a combined neural code for thermal sensory and gustatory hedonics. I'm going to talk to, to you a bit about these data today. So the trigeminal system. So humans have a trigeminal system, um, of, of course. Um, it's the trigeminal nerve supplies somatosensation for the craniofacial region. Um, and it's the trigeminal nerve. There are three major branches. Sometimes the trigeminal nerve is abbreviated with a V, which is actually a Roman numeral five. Um, and the mandibular and maxillary branches of the trigeminal nerve are likely heavily involved in um, oral thermal sensory processing, particularly the mandibular branch supplying the lingual nerve to the tongue, which of course is is carrying um, thermosensitive and chemesthetic messages to the CNS. Rodents also have a trigeminal system. Um, it's a little bit differently organized in terms of the, the barrel system that it supplies, which we, we humans don't, don't have. But again, there's this third branch of, of the trigeminal nerve supplying the lingual nerve to the tongue. Um, and these neurons are, these tri trigeminal neurons are, are quite sensitive to lingual temperature. And these are data from uh, Sierra Leone, who's, a, who's from Steve Roper's lab, where they, they apply calcium imaging to, to study the responses of trigeminal ganglion neurons to, to different temperatures. And they found there are different kinds of um, trigeminal ganglion cells that you could find based on whether or not they responded to cooling of the mouth or warming of the mouth. In some cases, some of these cells were bimodal. One very impressive thing about trigeminal cells that they, they can show very high sensitivity to small changes in temperature. And these are data from my own lab showing you basically a, if we, if we essentially cool the mouth by about one degree Celsius in this particular trigeminal neuron, which is in, which is recorded from the medulla, the cell rapidly increases its firing rate. And you can imagine um, that if we, we quickly became, we, Came aware that if we were going to study when we first started studying the trigeminal system that we had to have very precise control over temperature. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to study these neurons unless you do because of this very high sensitivity that they show to, to thermal inputs. Okay. Now the trigeminal nerve, this is the trigeminal ganglion, the trigeminal nerve um, projects into the um, brain and it forms the What's called the spinal, uh, the, the trigeminal tract, sometimes called the spinal trigeminal tract because it descends toward the spinal cord. And it, this is a, this tract basically courses a, the superficial sort of layer of, of, the, of medulla as it, as it tracks back towards the, the spinal cord. Um, now, I, I apologize to any neuroanatomists in the audience. This, this trigeminal brainstem complex is extremely difficult to draw, <laughs> it's extremely complicated. 
But I'm showing you here just sort of the basic organization of, of this system, um, whereby it's divided, the spinal trigeminal nucleus is divided into three subcomponents. Um, and there's also the principal trigeminal nucleus, which is most rostrally. Um, but the trigeminal nucleus caudalis has probably been the most heavily studied from the perspective of uh, understanding the role of trigeminal processing in oral thermal sensory uh, signaling and also oral chemesthetic sensations. A lot of this work was, was initiated by Earl Karstens and colleagues many, many years ago. Um, now, the, 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 spot, the, the, the VC, which I'm going to refer to it from here on out, um, is, is heavily populated by trip, trip V1 lineage somatosensory fibers. Okay, and you can see this is an image from our own files showing um, trip V1 lineage processes entering the superficial layers of, of the VC from the trigeminal tract. Um, and of course, trip V1 is the capsaicin receptor, which is a capsaicin and also a heat receptor. But a significant thing about these trip V1 lineage fibers is that trip V1 is actually also a developmental cell lineage marker for um, primary neurons sen sensitive to both heat and cold. And this was shown by Mark Hoon and colleagues where they used um, pre-mediated pre ablation of trip V1 lineage cells. And it caused essentially a, a loss of cold and heat behavioral responses measured in assays that are indexing spinal thermosensation. So sensing temperatures using, using the pause, for example. Now, <clears throat> because these, these uh, oh, and I should point out that these fibers are entering this part of the, of the subnucleus caudalis at a region where we actually sam sampled orosensory neurons. Okay, and so this is showing you the mark of an electrode that was placed here, and we recorded very robust orosensory activity. So it's probably no surprise that when you sample VC cells in, in, the, in, that, in, the, in that area, um, that they're very strongly sensitive to change in temperature applied to the mouth. Um, this is um, a schematic that shows you essentially an experiment that we can run in the lab where um, we can record from VC neurons in an, in an anesthetized mouse while flowing fluids into the animal's mouth. Okay, in this case, it's just water, but we can rapidly step and rapidly change the temperatures um, in, in the animal's mouth the fluids of the temperatures that are in, entering the animal's mouth um, just within a, you know, a few hundred milliseconds. And you can see when we do this here, this cell actually is very strongly sensitive to temperatures that fall below a 35 degree adaptation rent. So it's, it's a cooling sensitive neuron, okay? A lot of VC neurons are cooling sensitive cells. Now, this, this is a VC cell that we identified to project to the thalamus using a physiological method. Okay, if we could backfire this cell from by applying weak electrical pulses to the thalamus. And this lets us know that we're indeed recording from a VC cell and not a primary affluent. Okay. Now, one thing to note about VC thermosensory neurons is it's it's not just like there are cold neurons and hot neurons, for example, in the VC. There's there's sort of a, a very broad diversity of different kinds of thermoactive neurons that you find. In, 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 v, in the VC structure, um, and particularly for cooling, okay? And this is showing you an example of, 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 of a cluster analysis we applied to a set of VC thalamic projection neurons, and we clustered them based on their in vivo thermal response dynamics. Otherwise, in other words, the temporal response profiles they showed to different temperature steps applied to the mouth. Okay, and you can see that we found cells, we, we basically, these cells show very different types of um, temporal response characteristics. For example, cells in this class show a phasic response to cooling to seven degrees C, where they rapidly adapt to that temperature. This, these neurons show more of a tonic sustained firing pattern to, to, to this cold temperature. Um, whereas these, these shells show a, de a delayed type response to the activation to cold temperatures. Um, now, similar thermal response dynamics are found actually in the trigeminal ganglion. So that might suggest that some of what we're seeing here is due to, to dynamics that are occurring in the periphery. However, some recent data also show that biophysically, you also see um, differences in action potential um, temporal response profiles um, when, you, when you record directly from VC cells in, in an in vitro setting. 
and you can see that we see, you know, there are cells that show phasic type response patterns, tonic action potential response patterns, also delayed, and it seems to correlate pretty well, actually, correlate very nicely, at least, with what we see here. So some of this, some of these dynamics that we see could be due to both a combination of peripheral and, and central effects. Now, if we, if we simply just look at the firing rates of these cells, okay, you, you might see something like this. There's, and I'm showing you here um, data that from, from what we're calling cool cells, which are, which are active to sort of moderate cooling of the mouth, sort of a range of cool temperatures, and cold cells, which are responding more strongly to, to more extreme cooling of the mouth. Um, and these cells might be showing more of a graded type response, whereas these are actually very selective to a very narrow range of temperatures. And it turns out that maybe why, why this, this setup is needed is it may have something to do with, with coding. So for example, um, you could see that if we look at the, the actions of, of the cool neurons, they might, they might do a really good job of, of, of identifying moderate cool temperatures, but they couldn't tell you much about what was going on if, you, if there was an extreme cold stimulus in the mouth compared to warming, for example, so the response to 34 and 15 would, would be quite similar. And in fact, if you, if you apply more sophisticated analytic techniques to this, such as principal components analysis, to understand how these population responses are, are organized, you can see that PCA would actually confuse cold temperatures and warm temperatures if we only read the output of the cold, of the cool cells. But if we read, if we if we combine the actions of cool and cold neurons, we actually get more information to make a decision about what the temperature is inside the mouth. And that's because across these neurons, the patterns are more diverse. And this is actually um, picked up by principal components analysis. And you can see this in this plot as well. So for example, 32 evokes a pattern that's different from that evoked by 15. So there's more information available if we if we consider that a combinatorial type coding mechanism for cool temperatures. And similar mechanisms have, have actually been discussed for the coding of, of cooling and, and spinal pathways as well. Now, this doesn't, this of course is just a correlate. It doesn't, it doesn't show definitively that combinatorial coding is used in, in, in trigeminal circuits for thermal signaling, but it, it's something to consider. And with obviously further, further tests are needed, further studies are needed to, to address this. Now, remember how I showed you earlier that in the NTS, there's also cooling responses, there's thermal responses, but when you actually compare the temperature responses in the NTS in terms of the firing rates to what you see in, in VC, there is a market difference. It's almost like the, in, the thermal responses in the NTS are almost non-existent compared to the intensity of the responses that are evoked in the trigeminal system. And so this might suggest that, well, um, you know, at least in the medulla, trigeminal processing may be more important for registering temperature than what happens at the level of the NTS, at the level of gustatory neurons. However, when we when we move to a, when we move to the next synapse in the gustatory pathway that the NTS is projecting to, we see sort of a very different story in terms of thermo responses that emerge and gustatory neurons. And I guess we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about that now. So in, in rodents, the taste pathway projects from the NTS to a structure in the pons called the parabrachial area, which is receiving a lot of attention in recent times for its role in homeostatic and, and protective processing. It's been known since the 1970s that the parabrachial nucleus um, is, has neurons that, that respond to taste. This was work that was done um, in large part by Ralph Norgren and colleagues. Um, but there were some classic studies done um, years ago that actually suggested that trigeminal circuits originating from the VC actually come together or project to an area of the PB um, nucleus where taste neurons actually reside. I'm gonna show you some data here that, that sort of led us to investigate this in, in, in more detail. And, um, track tracing work done a long time ago by Cliff Saper's group actually found that the dorsal rostral VC, which contains orosensory cells, projects to the ventral lateral and medial PB areas where taste neurons are found. And in this, in this paper published in the 1980s, they even go on to suggest 
that the PB may represent a mechanism con for convergence of tongue somatic, somatic sensory afferents with lingual gustatory information. So people were thinking about this even back then. Um, work done by Susan Travers, where she's, she, she made recordings of, of taste neurons in the parabrachialaria, identified that in the external sub, the external capsule of the parabrachial nucleus, external medial, at least here the external medial area, there are taste neurons, okay? And this is a cell that's responding to quinine, which is a prototypical bitter taste stimulus applied to the circumvallate papilla, which is on the very caudal tongue. And you can see the cell shows a nice response to quinine. Um, and there were other studies done that did not look at taste, but they looked at nociceptive processing, nociceptive stimuli applied to the tongue and various, at various locations of the body as well. Um, by a group in France led by um, Bernard. And what they found was that in this same part of the PB area, the external medial PB nucleus, that you could find face tongue sensitive neurons that would fire to nociceptive inputs such as pinch or extreme heat applied to the tongue. And so we thought, well, were these studies actually looking at the same sets of neurons? And, but they were just simply studying them from different perspectives. And so to address this, um, a, a talented neurophysiologist in my lab, Jin Rong Lee, said, we, we set out to study this by, um, Jin Rong developed a preparation whereby she could stimulate the VC projection to the PB area while recording the responses of, of PB neurons to understand if the VC was actually communicating with, with, VC, with parabrachial taste cells. And we did that, we've done this, we, we, we did this a couple of different ways. And so one way is we used sort of a classic method to very apply weak electrical pulses to the VC to drive, orthodrom orthodromically drive this input to the parabrachial area. And this is what you might see if you did this, if you're recording from a PB neuron, you can see you can get, uh, okay, I think my computer just froze, whoops. Okay, I, I just lost my mouse, oh well. Um, okay, so anyway, um, okay, so, Did I lose my mouse? Okay, anyway, so yeah, so you can apply weak electrical shocks to the VC and you can actually drive parabrachial neurons. And that's what's shown by this, this trace in the upper left corner of, oh, there it is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is what's shown here, okay, with an example sweep shown in red. So we, we can drive this cell by applying weak electrical pulses to the VC. We've also used a more cell type selective form of circuit mapping where we used optogenetics to engage or excite the trivial lineage age afferents that arrive at the, at the VC. Um, to ex so we can excite these afferents um, and they synapse onto VC neurons that, that in turn, that we, we predicted would in turn project to the PB area. And indeed, when we make recordings from PB neurons, we can drive them using, op, using blue light applied to the VC to excite the terminals of these afferents. So we can actually identify neurons that are receiving input from trivi one lineage fibers, which are, which are mediating thermo, thermo sensation. And so when we do this, we actually see that many taste neurons in, in the PB area, particularly in the lateral PB area, which is where we targeted our recordings in this work, um, will fire to optogenic activation or optogenic excitation of trivi one lineage fibers. And this is a heat map showing you the responses of 94 taste neurons to, to their best taste stimulus. And this is the vehicle for that taste stimulus, so 28 degrees C water. And you can see most of these cells are actually responding quite well to taste. And most of these cells get VC input. The majority of these cells can be excited by electrical stimulation with the majority of those cells actually firing to optogenetic excitation of trivi one lineage fibers, okay? Now, we found that PB cellular tuning to taste actually associated with their sensitivity to trivi one lineage afferent stimulation. 
And this is showing you an example recording of a gustatory arm. This, if you were a gustatory neurophysiologist and you were going to you were going to go in in search of taste neurons and you wanted to categorize them based on their sensitivity to prototype taste stimuli, these are the stimuli you would use. Um, quinine and cyclexamide are prototypical bitters. Sucrose and umami, of course, are preferred tastes. And sodium chloride and citric acid are electrolytes. Okay, with citric acid associated with sourness and sodium chloride associated with, with saltiness. And we control the temperature of all the solutions as they enter the mouth as well to keep, to, to actually have very fine control of, of the temperature. And you can see this is a cell that responds quite strongly to bitter tastes. So it's activated almost exclusively by, by bitter taste in this case. And it shows very reliable act, excitation or activation to CHR2 excitation of, of trip one lineage afferents. Now, when we call this a trip one lineage positive taste neuron, now, trip one lineage negative taste neurons don't show this reliable activation. Even these are just random spikes acquired over 50 trials of the, of the laser pulse. And you can see this cell out shows a very different type of tuning profile. Okay, in fact, it's very strongly excited by sucrose, whereas is this, this cell is not. Also note this cell is very broadly tuned in some cases across sweet, umami, and, and electrolyte stimuli. Now, across a larger sample of cells across 94 PB neurons, um, we found actually that fused PB sweet neurons could be excited by trip V1 lineage afferents. Okay, and I'm showing you a, a heat map here um, where we identified clusters of gustatory neurons using a, a clustering algorithm. And this is sh showing you essentially the different clusters. So you have sodium cells, sweet cells, we're calling these sweet, they're, they're strongly responsible to sucrose and mommy electrolyte neurons, which are very broadly sensitive across electrolyte stimuli and bitter oriented cells. And very few of the sweet neurons we, re we recorded from actually responded to, to excitation of trippy one lineage fibers. In fact, the effect was statistically significant. Um, we did find, we also tested these cells with temperature and we found that temperature responses in PB gustatory neurons were associated with their ability to fire to trip V1 lineage afferents that arrive at the VC. And this is, this is the same cell I showed you earlier. Um, and you can see that this neuron is firing very, very strongly to delivery of, of 48 degrees C and 54 degrees C water to the mouth for a, a very, just a, just a few seconds. It's five, five second delivery. Um, notably, these are, these are temperatures that would be considered to be noxious heat, okay? They exceed, um, about 43 degrees centigrade, um, and they, they can do tissue damage if left, if left on tissue for too long. We found that essentially um, thermal responses in taste neurons were, were tightly associated with their ability to fire to tribulin jafferts across, across a number of, of different temperatures. And you can see that here, these are our trippy one lineage negative PB neurons, and these are our trippy one lineage positive cells with the temperature responses being much more robust in, in, in the positive neurons compared to the negative. And in fact, the response to 54 degrees uh, Celsius is, is significantly higher in, in the positive than negative neurons. There is some trend for these responses to be higher as well, but they don't survive alpha correction for multiple comparisons in a statistical analysis. These data are tricky to analyze because you, you can see that they're essentially, there, there's no normality here in the responses. Everything is is non-normal, which is typical of what, of what you see with sensory activity. Um, but essentially, this, this is, these data suggested that the ability of PB taste neurons to fire to temperatures was tied to their, to their receipt or their excitation to trigeminal trippy one lineage afferents. Now, when we looked, we reclassified the cells based on their gustatory and thermosensory response profiles. We found that noxious temperatures predominantly excited PB bitter taste neurons, okay? Cells that you would call um, bitter taste cells because they, they respond best or are oriented to bitter stimuli such as quinine and cyclohexamide. And in fact, the response in these heat bitter cells, which are here, okay, I'm again showing you a heat map and I've only highlighted a few stimuli here just for, for the sake of simplicity. Here's, this is the, oral delivery of water at 48 and 54 degrees C, and these are bitter stimuli. Um, and you can see that the responses to, to, the, to the 
heat, high temperatures predominantly arise in these what we call heat bitter cells, which is really a subpopulation of bitter neurons that are sensitive to heat. And the, the responses to heat are actually equivalent to those evoked by bitter stimuli in these cells. There's, there's no difference statistically between these response levels. Um, no, when we also when we did this, we also encountered a set of what we call cold neurons. And these we call these cold neurons because they tend to show much stronger activation to cooling than they did taste. Okay, now we we sampled all these neurons based on their sensitivity to taste stimuli, but we, we ended up capturing a set of cold cells here. Now, notably, these cells are firing quite strongly to, to a temperature that around 14 degrees, which in some cases actually is quite aversive to mice. So it's been shown that in, in spinal-based thermosensory assays, therm thermopreference tests, that mice will avoid temperatures around 15 or 14 degrees Celsius. And in fact, sometimes these that, that range of temperatures is also considered to be noxious cold, okay? But in, in, with regard to oral sensation, we, we don't really know. We don't really know how mice might actually react to the presence of say water at 14 degrees, for example, or 15 degrees. And so to address this, my lab has begun to actually um, use a custom made device, which is essentially just a, a Davis rig um, contact lachometer that we've converted to a thermo lachometer that, al that allows us to control the temperature of fluids that my sample and brief access tests. And so we can measure um, basically their orosensory preferences for different temperatures. And we're starting, we're starting to do this now. And notice that when we test mice with 15 degrees C water, that they really don't avoid it at all. Um, in fact, the, this lick ratio is, is calculated by their, their licks to the thermocontrolled water divided um, by their licks to room temperature water. And so if they're licking, if they're licking um, this temperature at the same rate as room temperature water, it will be right up here around, the lick ratio will be right around one. Okay, and that's what we see for, for, for these, this set of black six mice. The circles are actually the individual mouse responses, and this is the median and the confidence interval of the median. So 15 degrees C is not really a, a noxious temperature in, a, in an oral sensory setting for mice. And you can see, that this temperature, a similar temperature of 14 degrees C um, is not stimulating these heat bitter neurons. And so the, the noxious temperatures, at least out of the temperatures and tastes we tested in this study, that only the noxious temperatures were the, were the ones that excited the PB heat bitter cells. We also found that in some cases, and not, not, not in every case, but nociceptive agents, such as mustard oil and capsaicin, which of course mustard oil um, being an agonist of trip A1 and capsaicin being an agonist of trip B1 can also strongly excite these PB heat bitter cells. The end result of all this is that what we see when we look at the population response across the PB area is that bitters and nociceptive agents, nociceptive stimuli, noxious heat and nociceptive chemicals um, induce correlated patterns of activity, very strongly correlated patterns of activity. And these, these responses are separated from stimuli that would be innocuous or actually preferred in some cases by PB, by PB responses. And what's, the, what's interesting about this too is that this process in, involves what you might call traditionally, tr traditionally defined taste neurons, okay, cells that, um, you know, you, if you were just using taste stimuli, you, were, and you, you would find these cells that are selectively tuned to bitter inputs, for example, but it's only when you start to probe them with, their, with temperatures and also their ability to respond to trib one lineage afferents and chemesthetic agents that you start to uncover their true response profile, um, which goes far beyond, far beyond taste and suggesting that they have a function that, is, that is, involves taste, but it, it might, it, it's, there's a broader role here. Now, one of the questions that, that immediately emerges, is, well, what's happening here? So how, how is this happening? Is, is, it, is this really, is this convergence of temperature um, and, and gustatory information in the PB area? Is that really due to a convergent process? Or is it, or is it the case that um, temp, uh, gustatory stimuli, for example, can stimulate trigeminal fibers? And, and, and that's what we're seeing here. Now, this has been discussed before in the literature, and there's also there's also some data available to suggest that um, tastes like quinine, for example, do not stimulate at least 
trigeminal neurons in the, in the, in the, in the VC. But we wanted to know if, if there was a way that we could experimentally disassociate bitter and heat responses um, by perturbing trigeminal circuits. So the idea being that if we, if we silence trigeminal projections to the, to the PB area, can we, can we silence, can we selectively disrupt temperature responses and leave taste responses intact with the idea that the taste responses are coming from, from the NTS? And so we, we, we attempted this using a mouse model where chelmerdopsin is, is expressed in, in VGAT positive neurons, which are inhibitory neurons, okay? And VGAT positive cells um, populate the VC as, as shown here in these data. And the idea was that, and this, this approach has been used before, it's a very robust way to inhibit neural activity. So it's called, in some ways, silencing by excitation. Which, um, and the idea is that if we can engage the inhibitory network, we can silence the VC projection to the peep area and understand how turning temporarily turning off that input might affect the temperature processing in PB cells. Now, just to show you how this, how this works, if we make a recording from the VC, in one of these VGAT CHR2 mice. Um, this is what you would see under control conditions. And when we turn on our laser, we can just stop the cell from firing to temperature. And you can see once the laser um, is turned off, the cell comes back, as you, as you can see here. And you can flip back and forth between these conditions um, very, very reliably. Um, OK, so this shows you what happens in the VC. So what about the PV? And so to do this, we, we place our recording electrode back into the PV and we sought out these heat bitter neurons while we had a, an optic fiber, a fiber optic probe um, directed to the VC. And this is what we, this is an example of what we saw in, in one cell. And so the way we did these studies is, is we, we actually tested the cells with a lot, of, a lot of trials for each stimulus. You have to do this with sensory neurons because of the, the variability in how they respond. And this actually kind of shows you the experiment where we, we went back and forth between control and, and laser on condition. Okay, and so this is the raster for this cell's response to quinine under control. And this is the raster for the cell's response under the VC laser condition where the inhibition is engaged. And you can see going back and forth between these trials, there's not really a lot happening. And, and this is the overall effect, um, the, the, the average effect over all the trials in terms of, of the firing rate. This same neuron also was heat sensitive. And this is what we saw when we silenced VC projections to the PBN in, in the cell um, during the oral delivery of heat. And you can see there's actually a marked decrease in responding to the cell. And this decrease is actually significant. And this was determined using a, a receiver operating characteristic curve um, based method that allows for analysis of data from single cells. Now across a larger sample of neurons, this, this is, a, this is a, a summary figure that shows you what we saw, and we, we saw that we could reliably suppress responses to noxious heat and by, by silencing VC projections to the PV area. But it did not really have a lot of effect. It didn't really affect quinine responses at all. And in our, our control mice, which are non-carrier animals that don't express channel redops in VGAT cells, um, there was no effect of, of the laser procedure. So this suggested that we could, we could decouple heat and bitter responses by perturbing the trigeminal projection to the PB area, which is further evidence that indeed what we might be seeing here is, is a conversion type process. So these data suggest to us that taste and trigeminal pathways might merge, they, they appear to merge in, in the parabrachial area, particularly in the lateral parabrachial area where we've targeted our recordings. And the organization of the responses that we see um, in terms of not only the, the responses to the stimuli, but the organization of the cells them, themselves actually suggest that taste and thermal sensations might be components of a common neural code for hedonics, at least at the level of the parabrachial area. You can see this is, we're actually using principal components to sort the neurons by their thermogustatory tuning profiles. And what's interesting about this is you can see that the bitter and heat bitter neurons cluster together and they're strongly separated. They're, they're, they show the broadest separation from sweet cells, which are responding to preferred tastes with um, neurons oriented to innocuous cooling and also um, sodium and electrolyte concentrations. I'm sorry, sodium and citric acid concentrations that do not induce strong aversion in rodents, sort of separate, 
positioned mid-range between sweet and bitter nociceptive cells. So there's still a lot left to do here. We don't, we don't have this all figured out. This is sort of a, a very new area of, of study looking at taste and, and temperature processing of the PV structure. Um, and there's, there's still a lot left to do. And one of, the, in this, one of the things that we're interested in right now is determining the genetic cell types that are involved with, with taste nociceptive integration. Um, a very strong candidate for, for this, of course, are, are the, the neurons in the lateral parabrachial area that express CALCA, the gene for calcitonin gene-related peptide. These, these cells have been shown to be involved in um, integrative protective processing by the work of Richard Palmatier and colleagues. And um, are, but are, are, are the heat bitter neurons, heat bitter taste neurons that we see in, um, in, in the PB area, are they, are they actually these CALCA cells? And this is something that we're, we're actively investigating now. We also, we also need a better understanding of the role of, of the trigeminal system, the temperature signals from the trigeminal system and thermo effectors on trigeminal afferents in taste behavior. There's very little data on how temperature affects taste behavior. In fact, it could be argued that right now, there are only two published papers from one group, Anne-Marie Torre Grossa, um, that have addressed the effect of temperature in an oral sensory setting. Um, and so it's the, the effect of temperature on taste ingestive behavior in, in an oral sensory setting, I should say. Um, and in my own lab with our new thermo lycometer, we're actually starting to study how temperature can affect taste preference behaviors and the, and the role of, of trigeminal, trigeminal um, effectors in these behaviors as shown here. We're actually starting to see that um, cooling can actually suppress quinine avoidance in mice and that this effect is actually lost in animals that lack trypm 8 which is the menthol cold receptor. Okay, and this is suggesting that there, there's an interaction between um, cooling sensations mediated by trypamate and, and bitter taste avoidance. And notably that when we test these same animals under room temperature conditions, we, we, they don't show differences in, in their responses to climate. It's only when we start to cool stimuli that, that we start to see an effect of, of knocking out trypamate. And finally, um, we have to wonder as well, do any of, is, is any of what we see in the PV with regard to taste temperature interactions, th does it tell us anything about how taste might intersect with pain related signals? That the, the lateral PV area is, is heavily, there's a huge interest in understanding how the lateral PV area um, is involved in processing pain related information at, at the moment. Um, there's a, and, and so, um, and, and also trip B1 lineage fibers, which are, are thermosensory fibers, they also have roles in, in, in pain and oral facial pain as shown here by um, data from Mankyo Chung's group where um, they measured basically a, a, an oral facial behavioral response in the, the mouse, based on the mouse grimace scale to masseter muscle inflammation. Um, and they found that they could actually reduce this response by um, using chemogenetics to inhibit trivial one lineage afferents. And so because these trivial one lineage afferents are driving thermal responses in PV taste neurons, is there any intersection between taste and pain related processing that, that, is, that this might be driving in the PV circuits? And, and how might, how, how, what could this tell us about how pain might be, um, pain related signals could be modified by taste? Okay, so that being said, um, I'd like to point out, give, give credit to those who really contributed a lot to this work, including Jin Rong Lee, who um, is a master neurophysiologist and, and did most of the recordings that, that were, were presented here, um, and also graduate students, David Wilson and, and Kyle Zampano for their help with the behavioral studies. And also I'd like to point out um, Big thanks to the NIH for their continued support of, of this work. And thank you. Thank you, Chris. So I guess it's time for questions. And let's see, does anyone have questions? And Mike, I see you're ready to go. Yes, what do you think is the selective advantage from an evolutionary point of view of being able to, to detect temperature in the mouth Temperature in the mouth? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so ther thermos, the, the thermosensory circuits in the mouth, they, 
they may be an extension of, of the spinal thermosensory system. Um, we don't we don't know. We we, we this is I, I'm, this is just sort of a, of a guess here. Um, and so the the they they the the preferences for for temperature that you might see in the mouth might have something to do with um, driving the animal towards a, a temperature condition that might drive thermo neutrality. Okay, so there are optimal temperatures for therm optimal thermo neutral temperatures that, that basically allow an animal to thermoregulate with, with minimal met metabolic cost. Um, and so from the perspective of the mouth, how, how, how temperature sensing in the mouth might drive, drive that, we, we, we don't know. Um, but it might, if you think about it in terms of that perspective, it might tell you something about the, the preferences that animals show for, shows an animal will show for temperatures in the mouth. So for example, in a mouse, thermoneutral temperatures can be around about 30 degrees C or so. Um, and if we assume, now we, we don't, I don't know of any data that has actually measured closed mouth temperature in, in mice, but in, it has been done in humans by Barry Green and it's, it's about 35 degrees. And so um, the temperature that's, that fall below 35 degrees might be, might be considered to be moving towards this thermoneutrality range. And that might be why cooling is preferred in the mouth, but those same cool temperatures are actually avoided when applied to the spinal system or, or the paws where resting temperature is a lot lower. Now, um, yeah, so does that, does that kind of answer your, address your question? Well, I guess the mouse doesn't have a choice of what temperatures of the food that it can select is. You know, it, it's not as if we get ice cream and mice get ice cream and uh, chili peppers and things in their natural diet. Sure, sure. Um, but I, I will actually connect to that. Um, I mean, couldn't be temperature in your case being mostly uh, a proxy for, you know, possibly toxic substances? Because we know that TRPV1 and TRPM8 are like sort of promiscuous, uh, so polymodal receptors. So as you've shown already, capsaicin activates the same subsets of the neurons. And so would it be more likely that this preference for, you know, or not preference for certain temperatures will be more co correlated with preference or not preference for a response due to chemical TRPV1 or TRPM8 agonist? It could be, yeah. So maybe, are you saying that like maybe the temperature is, is secondary? Temperature? Yeah, that basically, you know, temp temperature is another way to activate those receptor, but probably the primary reason why there is this sensitivity is mostly to detect, you know, chemicals that activates the same subsets of fibers. That's yeah. That, that's also that's a good possibility. Sure, um, and and maybe it's just that th those effectors are are sensitive to, to chemicals and temperatures, and may, maybe the temperature is, is sort of a a, a side effect. Of yeah, that. I mean, I, I think that's you know the the beauty and the complexity of working with TRPV one or TRPM eight that they are you know with the being polymodal sometimes they kind of give us troubles to really, you know, frame the results due to either a reason or the other. And then yeah. building up on that, you, you have been showing that, um, so I don't know if I missed it or not, but like, which were your responses for um, mustard oil? So the same neurons were also activated by the, the bitter, the heat bitter cells were also activated by mustard oil? Yes, not, not all of them. Some, no, some no. Yeah, we, we find actually more activation. So the heat bitter cells, um, there, there are more neurons that will co-fire to bitter and heat, and then a subset of those heat bitter cells um, will show sensitivity to capsaicin and, and mustard oil. Hmm. It's not the case that every time you find a heat bitter neuron that it's going to respond to capsaicin or, or mustard oil. Now, yeah it's important to point out that the way that we test capsaicin might have something to do with that because we apply capsaicin only to the, to the rostral tongue, whereas the heat stimulus is bathed in, in, 
it's basically a whole mouth flow of water at, at a controlled temperature. And so um, that might have some, some effect on, on what we see. But there's, yeah, so it's, but mustard oil in their hand is applied to the whole mouth. And, and we still, it, it's not the case that every heat bitter neuron will fire. It's, some of them do. And that, that may relate to, um, it, it, may, it may, may reflect, and I, I don't know, this is a speculative guess, but there could be different subtypes of, of afferents that, that are part of that triply one lineage projection that, that, are, that are being stimulated by the, the chemical nociceptive agents and then the chemical nociceptive agents in temperature. Yeah, I was and, mostly, yeah, because I was mostly thinking that at least what we know from the trigeminal ganglion is that most of the time TRP1 is co-expressed with TRPV1, which is yeah. not the, the opposite. So we have a subset of only TRPV1 expressing trigeminal neurons, but I think that the subset of only TRP1 expressing neurons is really low. And so I was wondering like how that will affect like your response in the moment you have a TRPV1 knockout, you will probably still see some of those cells like the heat bitter cells that, responding or yes, to chemicals yeah. or to cold? Because that's the other question is TRP1 is a cold receptors or not, right? Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, it depends on which paper you, you I, read. Depending on the paper you're reading. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of mixed data on whether or not TRIP-A1 is a cold receptor. Um, it does look like though that it, it has, it's, it's a tricky receptor to study from, from for, for cooling sensitivity um, based on some data that's out there. We, we have done work with knocking out TRIP-A1 and looking at how that affects menthol sensitivity. And it does affect, if, if you knock out TRIP-A1, you actually lessen the avoidance a mouse shows to menthol. Whereas if you knock out trip 8 you actually increase the avoidance a mouse shows to menthol in a brief access fluid licking test. Um, but yeah, whether, whether or not TRIP-A1 is, is a cooling sensor in, for, for what we see in, the, in, in oral sensory processing, um, we, we don't know mm. and the data and for, for, for other, for the spinal system as well. It's there's, there's mixed evidence for it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I was wondering since you, you're playing with both temperature, heat and cold, like if that could actually play a confounding factor in case it's temperature sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So anyone else has a question? Do we have more questions? Otherwise. We let Chris have his meetings. Okay, so seems not. So thank you everyone. Thank Chris again for this uh, this talk. And yeah, in my case, see you later. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.